Oh, hello there. It's just I with braids. It's been like two years, long overdue. I deserve it. It took six hours and my neck is barely okay. Thanks for asking. Hello, hi, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home skillet biscuit? And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies in a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. I am very proud of myself because I am filming this, though late at night, not the day before. One of the things that I'm doing right now is saying to myself when I want to procrastinate and make things harder for future me, I say to myself, you deserve to do things that make things easier on you sometimes. You know the drill. We're gonna send it over to Admiral Kenny. Bills always have to be paid. I will say though, hallelujah, I was able to fill my tank with $60 yesterday. Nothing else is going well. But when it was 110, I cried at the pump, so thank you. Anyway, we're gonna send that over though to Admiral Kenny, peace. Hello everyone, it's Admiral Kenny to let you know that today's video is sponsored by Raycon. I don't know why I did that with my mouth. Raycon's everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. You know the drill, optimize gel tips so that you can find one that best fits your specific ear holes so that you can wear them for hours without being in pain. And most importantly, they don't come out. They offer eight hours of play time, the case has a 32 hour battery life, and they're priced just right at about half the price of other premium audio brands. With over 50,000 five-star reviews, it's obvious that I'm not the only one who's uh, talking about Raycon these days. There's three different sound profiles. I personally am a bass girl, so I like things that are very low in heavy. Also, there's a noise isolation and awareness mode that allows you to hear a car coming or um, just live in blissful ignorance. <laughs> so if you'd like to try out Raycon, you can go to buyraycon.com slash Kenny and get 15% off your Raycon purchase. Big thanks again to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. Okie dokie, artichoke. Last week we um, talked about, not bad movies, but we talked about three classic movies that I saw for the first time. Those being The Shining, Carrie, and The Exorcist. And apparently I had some very controversial <laughs> opinions, particularly about Carrie. People did not like my opinion on Carrie. Uh, the short and sweet of it is that I kind of lost my sympathy for Carrie when she decided to uh, kill everyone at prom and not just her bullies. Man, I thought we were gonna do like a, like a I saw the devil type revenge fest, but I'm like, no, you just went all, the world hates me and everybody hates me. My mom's terrible and the school sucks. Let me kill everybody at prom. And it's like, ooh. But with that said, a lot of people were saying, maybe I should read the book because it makes them more sympathetic there or I should, watch any of the various myriad of remakes and adaptations and sequels. There's a musical, apparently. I've been considering going down the Carrie rabbit hole to see if any of them will make me feel any different about it. I was thinking though, maybe I would enjoy Carrie more if I didn't think of it as how a lot of people kind of talk to me about it in this way that it's like kind of this righteous revenge fantasy, justice fantasy, and instead think of it as like a pure tragedy in which nothing is moralized, nothing is considered like cathartic, it's just sad. But the problem is this movie is so campy, it's hard to think of it as that, is that serious, I don't know. Anyway, check out the video though, it'll be linked up above or you can check it out in the Bad Movies and a Beat playlist. Okay, this week, Netflix. They're always doing shit. I don't even really know where to start with this week. <laughs> um, I was getting requests to watch a, a new Netflix original, Romance. So those words together are always promising. There's this new movie called Purple Hearts that apparently has been watched quite a bit. And the thing that kind of scares me is that I feel like it wasn't really hate watched up that minutes watched ladder, weirdly enough. I feel like, this is just me, this is just the vibe I'm getting, that people genuinely like this movie. I have taken it upon myself because I must change that. I must be the change that I wanna see in the world because what the f 
is going on? Uh, we are talking about a movie that encompasses all of my least favorite things, least favorite subcategories, if you will, that exists within my favorite genre, actually, which is, may surprise you guys, because I sound very jaded when it comes to relationships and like romance, but it's not that. I just find that the me the genre is often trash. But if it gets it right, I do like an enemies to lovers, and I do like a friends to lovers. And if you're able to do either of those right, uh, please send me links because I'm I, I haven't found many. <laughs> if you have like a good suggestion for like a good book that's enemies to lovers or romance to lovers that isn't like super cheesy and misogynistic, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. But this one is like a subcategory under enemies to lovers, my least favorite, which is not enemies to lovers, but falling in love with a literal bigot. Despite our meaningful political and social differences, we fell in love despite one of your views being a direct threat on the other person's literal life. <laughs> I think the last time we talked about this particular trope is when we talked about Neo Ned, which was now about a year or two ago. Time sure flies when you're having fun. Which funny story, that movie comes up relatively often on Twitter. Every time it does, I hear about it because people always recommend my video instead of watching the movie. Also, if you search the movie on Google, my video is one of the first pictures you'll see. This is my legacy. But this movie, I can't even blame the early 2000s for. This came out like three weeks ago. The movie is called Purple Hearts. And I saw someone on Twitter say that because he's red, she's blue, but they come together to make purple hearts. <laughs> That and it, there's military related information in this movie. So that's a double entendre, they real deep. This movie is, oh my God, impressively bad. And I love trash, babe, I do. That's why we have this whole series. I love things that suck, but this was a lot. It had so many things that I hate all at once and forced me to sit through it for two hours. It's the story of a half Mexican? I don't know. At least half Mexican girl. Someone with a Mexican mother. I don't know what her dad was. Liberal, starving artist, musician more specifically, who enters into a fake marriage with a conservative Marine. They both need money for various reasons. He needs it because he had a past of addiction and he owes money to his old dealer. And she needs it because she's dying because she can't afford her insulin. So they begrudgingly devise a plan to enter into a fake marriage because he's a Marine and they can get the insurance, the health insurance that she needs to buy her medication and he can get the extra money that they give for Marines with spouses. But considering this is supposed to be a romance, somehow end up perhaps catching feelings and the marriage isn't all fake after all. And if that wasn't bad enough, remember when I said she's a starving musician? So it's also a musical. So everything I love, love musicals. I really thought that we had gotten past the whole like let's f away oppression uh, arc of romance and film, but apparently it's in its Renaissance era. You can't break its soul, one would say. I love how everyone's like, I have no idea how to spell Renaissance, but my high school was called Renaissance. So I am learned, love. <laughs> it's a lot of S's in it though. But yeah, I, I really thought we were past the like, we can fuck away bigotry and your political views literally resulting in me possibly not being able to pay for medication that I need to literally live. Oh, I got it all in my eye, wow. Success. This is gonna be an interesting day <laughs> because this was not what I was trying to do with this look at all, but it tried to take me out of the game. So I just find it very, very funny that a lot of people feel like dating a conservative, particularly a white man conservative and you being non-white or non-conservative makes him any less conservative. I also find it very weird the amount of conservatives that match with me on Bumble. It feels like a threat. You see me uh, ostentatiously Negro and you're like, ooh, she's my, I'm not racist. I got a black girlfriend card. Let's go for that. Absolutely not. You can suck my ass. I have an idea, but it's risky. Risking it for the biscuit. <sighs>
Why do I do this to myself? I couldn't just do a regular liner. I just had to make this so extra for no reason. Like there's a big, like agree to disagree thing that I've noticed among couples, which I find hilarious because he will love you, quote unquote. He will marry you, probably have kids with you and then still uh, vote directly in opposition to your safety and well-being. <laughs> and that's what this movie is. Like this glorification of this particular dynamic of people, two people with opposed viewpoints on things, different life experiences, but they're somehow able to let love prevail. And it's like, girl, he's still voting in a way in which you don't get insulin. Wow, this looks terrible. Sorry. <laughs> We're rolling with it. We'll see if we can make it into a look. Otherwise you're just long for the ride, baby. And that's what this movie is. Falling in love with a man that at no point conceded or changed his opinions or stance on anything, but they found a commonality in their love. Girl, shut the f up. He's agreeing to disagree about your mom being in the country. Like, what are you talking about? And then as if that concept in and of itself wouldn't bother me beyond belief, they decide to add a musical element. So we have to wade through her seemingly endless lists of singing performances and my God, do I hate her voice. Her voice is giving a uh, Camilla Cantaloupe. It was very Cam Camilla Cantaloupe. And that's a lot to listen to in a two hour period. It was a lot going on. Like, I don't know. I just feel like this movie, especially coming out after the overturn of Roe v. Wade, it feels like, what did we learn? What did we learn about our agree to disagree relationships when you woke up without rights and suddenly he's like, well, imagine knowingly a man who doesn't believe in you having rights. Embarrassing. But on the lighter side, this movie is incredibly bad, like structurally. The acting is terrible. The writing is terrible. Oddly enough, the audio quality as well, atrocious. Most of it is in dub <laughs> and everything is atrocious. And I love making fun of bad movies. So this is why you came to watch. Okay. So without further ado, and most of my makeup is done, this is Purple Hearts. 2022. The film begins and we meet our lead character. Her name is Cassie, who sings covers of popular 80s songs at the bar at which she also is a waitress. Is Sweet Caroline from the 80s? I definitely just pulled that decade out of my ass. <laughs> I will say there was only one cover or one song in general in this uh, entire movie that I thought she actually did a good job on. Uh, she ends up seeing Rebel for Kicks later. And I was like, okay, I actually like this cover. I like it slowed down. And walks in a group of Marines who later we find out are there celebrating because they are about to be shipped off to Iraq. Um, upon them entering the bar, it's obvious that uh, Cassie doesn't have particularly a soft spot for Marines. But within the group of Marines that come in, there's a black boy named Frankie, whom apparently Cassie already knows. Apparently they're childhood friends. She's a few years older than him and she used to babysit him when they were younger. But now he's all grown up and he willfully fights for America. Um, and they seem to be very happy to finally be reunited. We meet another dude who comes in with the group who is going to be our main love interest his name is Luke and his face is incredibly familiar to me. And for the life of me, I can't quite place where I know his face from and it drives me crazy. Could I look it up? Of course. It takes away the fun of being able to like frustratedly snap my fingers at the TV and be like, oh, 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 and never reach a conclusion. I'm sure you'll tell me in the comments, but. Oh, you don't have to, it's the prince from Camilla Cantaloupe's Cinderella. I told you there's something going on here. So Cassie goes to get drinks for the table. And while she's gone, Luke is kind of alluding to considering chatting her up. One of the uh, other waitresses, Cassie's friend and also a fellow bandmate was like, no, Cassie isn't into army guys. She really doesn't like army guys. She doesn't, or I guess Marines aren't army guys, are they? They're military people. And when she comes back, one of the guys, who I'm gonna call Meathead, says this. So we're good enough to fight for your ass, but not good enough to touch it. 
<laughs> These are the words of a man that gets absolutely no pussy. These are the words of a man who masturbates with a delicate pinching movement as if he's picking up a stray nickel from the ground. These are the words of a man who has taken his pants off and all he's been met with was sadness, pity, and confusion. Maybe a question or two about what exactly am I supposed to do with it? Floss. Needless to say, he will be sufficiently annoying throughout the rest of this movie and he will be somewhat of a catalyst for their love for some reason, I don't know, between Luke and Cassie. Uh, this is fucking stupid. Speaking of which, when she storms off, Luke is the one to go to her to essentially apologize on behalf of his meathead friend, which he also uses as an opportunity to introduce himself and theoretically get the ball rolling on his attraction to her. Cassie is like, no thanks, I'm not interested in talking to any of you. I don't like military men which has been stated already. And Luke, in response to this says, essentially, I know your type, you lib. Kind of predictable, I've, I've met your type before. Drive a Lexus that your parents paid for, but it's a hybrid, so it's okay. <laughs> you don't wanna do anything, right? Because guns are mean, you're a pacifist. I guess it's our job to go off and fight those battles for you. After this incredibly riveting exchange, she goes back and talks to that friend that she works with. Apparently one of the other Marines has started flirting with her and said that if you ever stop being into girls, you should marry me because I get really good health insurance. <laughs> This of course is topically significant because Cassie secretly has type one diabetes. Um, they never really explain why she keeps it secret. It's diabetes, but she leaves out very secretly to, to give herself insulin. But they, they, because she makes it so secretive, it's like she's going out to do hard drugs, heroin. <laughs> There's several scenes where she's just like, on the brink of passing out, eye makeup smudged, and she's just taking insulin, but it looks like she's riding that brown tiger to heaven. Cassie's running really low on her insulin because she's been kind of spacing it out so that she doesn't have to buy anymore because it's really f***ing expensive. Again, very topically significant in today's day and age. Did y'all know that a bunch of Republicans voted to not make it accessible to get insulin for a, for a reasonable price? Agree to disagree. Very upset about this. This eye, will constantly play me for the rest of my life. If you don't wanna see my lopsided liner, just think of it as a podcast. Anyway, so anyway, she goes to the pharmacy, right? Cause she's running out of her backup of insulin. And they tell her that she can't come in to get her prescription filled for another four days because her insurance won't cover it. Which as you can imagine for someone that needs insulin to literally live, they say to you, you got the money to live. Again, great old US healthcare system. Also the cashier at Walgreens takes her job a little too seriously. She's like, first of all, either you pay out of pocket or die, you poor insulin deficient bitch. I'm paraphrasing, of course. In comes Cassie's mom, who's able to give her a few dollars, hopefully towards the medication, but even that's not enough. So she just says, fine, I'll just try to make what very little I have last until Friday. Meanwhile, Luke is on a jog. Jogging, as we'll find, is one of the things that Luke likes to do to clear his mind. It's a big uh, therapy for him and he does it often. He wants to run marathons in every major city in the US and that's what's really important to him. Luke is on a run and he almost gets run down by somebody in a pickup truck in broad daylight and nobody sees shit apparently. The driver is some dude named Jono. Jono is Luke's former dealer, whom for some reason we'll find out later, he owes $15,000. He says in a very quirky maniacal villain type of way that you either get me my money or I like slaughter your family in cold blood. <laughs> Buddy old pal. Cassie back at her job ends up singing that uh, cover of Rebel for Cakes that I actually didn't mind. But while she's up there, you can tell that she's feeling a bit loopy and not feeling well. And she's able to stumble away and get the last bit of the insulin into her. This was the scene I was talking about. But uh, while she's in there though, she sees a Marine sticker stuck on the bathroom mirror. And that's when she says, I got an idea. Let me go marry a Marine to get free healthcare. So she goes to little baby Frankie. Um, he's apparently hosting like a going away party, but who answers the door? Luke. Apparently they're staying together until they get shipped off because they're friends or bunk mates or something. They know each other. Cassie goes in, asks Frankie, hey, will you marry me, buddo? Will you marry me? 
Oh, buddy, oh, pal. And then she goes on to explain, hey, I need the insurance. I'm literally going to die. This bitch comes in and he's like, you can't do that. My dad's retired military police and this is fraud. So I guess you're gonna just have to suck it up and die. Cause the last thing we'd wanna do is hurt the government's feelings or some shit. Like at this point, I'm getting so frustrated because literally, in, in the very premise of trying to make them seem like they're just two people who have different views of things, you're literally proving my fucking point. <laughs> you're proving the point that these two things are not the same. One is literally, I'm offended by people not standing during a song about the country versus I want access to healthcare so that I don't f die. These are not the same. <laughs> like he essentially looks at her and says, F you and your life, big daddy government. But at last back to Frankie who sorrowfully says that he can't do it. One, because possibly he doesn't want to get in trouble. And two, because he currently has a very serious girlfriend and she probably wouldn't be, wouldn't be cool with that. A bit downtrodden, Cassie decides to leave, try to find some other way to figure things out. Back to Luke and his problems, cause we're supposed to care. <laughs> he goes to his family, particularly his brother and his family to visit. It would seem that they have a bit of a strained relationship due to Luke's past of addiction. There's also hints that Luke and his father aren't on great terms, but Luke tells his brother that he needs some money and this makes his brother get suspicious, like what's going on again? You know I don't have any money, you know I can't help you if you've done some shit with your addiction again, I can't bail you out. He assumes it has something to do with Jono. Don't make me use this, you gotta pay me. Hear me out. I gotta say, he's one of the least intimidating antagonists I've seen in one of these movies and they tend to be pretty bad, like the bad guy, the evil guy you need to watch out for. Uh, but he's particularly bad. So here we are, Luke is in a pickle. He needs a lot of money. And so after bitching about how much he would hate to hurt the government's feelings, he's like, let's do exactly what I judged you for doing. Let's do this marriage shit. And does he apologize? Absolutely not. That would be too much like constructive deep thought that would lead you to change your positions on things. He just says, let's just get married then. If I can trust a lib who doesn't give a shit about the law or the military, I can sure- I have an ethical me. code that doesn't include blind obedience and I desperately need this to literally survive. Whereas you could be stockpiling supplies for your bro militia. I'm leaving. This was a mistake. Bro militia. Luke. Liberal. Luke. So they meet in a diner or something and decide to make up a short story of how they fell in love so quickly, which isn't a very good story either. And nobody seems to question it enough for my liking, but whatever, it's a movie. After their argument in the bar, he chased her down, convinced her to go out with him. And now the rest is history, they're in love. They love each other so much that they're gonna get married after knowing each other maybe at most two weeks. So not at all suspicious at all if you don't want it to look like a fraudulent marriage, but here we go. Now, if they're not able to convince everybody that this is a real marriage, he can get court martialed and go to jail and she could probably serve some time as well for fraud. So the plan is that they get married, he gets deployed off to Iraq, she's able to stay here and they have to just like send emails occasionally and a FaceTime here or there to, you know, fool everybody into thinking that they care about each other. And they send love letters so that it looks like a real marriage of someone who just got married and is in love, like the peak of love. Y'all met three days ago. So when he comes back a year later, they can get divorced and boom, all over and done. Therefore she gets a year of free healthcare. All this for just a year of free healthcare. Okay, but before he's set to leave, she would have to join a group dinner with the other Marines on his uh, platoon or something. I don't know the words or whatever. Spend the night at a local hotel because apparently that's where all this Marine couples spend their last night or whatever. They wanted to look as real as possible. I of course suspected that was just like a poorly written lead in to sex between these two people who theoretically would never be in the same room otherwise. It's a hard job being psychic. They go to the courthouse to get married. Frankie is their only witness and he also brings a wedding ring because apparently he was going to propose to his girlfriend and he decided to let them borrow the ring because he doesn't want to propose to her and then go off to Iraq. He wants to do it once he gets back so that he can stay with her. And at that moment, I said a kind hearted black boy who plans to return from war, <laughs> he ain't gonna make it. 
psychic. <laughs> also, as a side note, you gave my ring to your friend to fake a marriage for a year. You had another bitch wearing my ring. What? But they get faked married, they kiss, it's awkward, but it's done. The worst is out of the way. They can both benefit from the marriage. Now to go to that terrible marine dinner that she was told that she has to go to. While there, no one thinks in any deep way that it's weird that they've known each other again for maybe three weeks at this point and got married, but they're just like, cool, whatever, it be's like that. Meathead uh, is there. So Meathead does what Meathead does. This one is to life, love, and hunting down some goddamn Arabs, baby! Woo! All right. Making it sound like you're hunting down everyone of a certain ethnicity, which sounds kind of problematic. Yeah, Cassie, he gets it. He's just stirring the pot. See, that's why you're not gonna make it back. I'm out here serving my country. What are you doing exactly? I don't know. Apparently, I'm telling a Marine he shouldn't be hunting down Arabs. Get your girl. That's Excuse enough. me? Get no, her. he doesn't get me. Yeah, that's does. enough. Both of you, sit down. You bitch, you better stand up. <laughs> bitch, you better stand up. You better lock your knees. God, I just love nuanced conversations like these. What are you storming off for? And bitch, listen to this. When she goes after him for some reason, he's mad at her for just not taking the joke because you know what Meathead meant. He didn't mean like literally kill all Arabs, men being men, boys being boys. Again, love story. Love that we can get past our differences and find love in the end and that he's gonna make no concessions by the end of this movie. So this is great. Uh, he learns nothing, by the way. But they argue, and it's some of the most infuriating shit to behold. But at the end of it, uh, they say, well, if other people are looking at us, we gotta look like we love each other, so hug me. And it's the most awkward and frustrating thing to behold. So we're just gonna hug away the fact that you literally just defended a person who was like, yeah, let's go in genocide. Like what? <laughs> he never reflects on himself and be like, hey, I probably shouldn't do that anymore. No, nothing. If anything, she concedes because she doesn't have a lot of trust for men because of like the men that her mom used to date. Um, and eventually she learns how to love. And then they go to the hotel that they were supposed to go to. The one that I said is an obvious write-in, very Wattpad-esque uh, for a situation for them to have sex. So they go to the hotel, he sits down and he opens up and he's like, I am scared to go to Iraq. Not I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't believe in a system that makes it so that you had to enter into a false marriage with me to get medication that you need to literally live. He says nothing. He says, I fear going to the war that I signed up for. And his vulnerability is rewarded with pussy. I just couldn't imagine knowingly a man who believes that your human rights are just like a matter of opinion. <laughs> People do it every day. Uh, I'd be embarrassed, but you know, different strokes, different folks. She wakes up and he is just coming back from a run because he's a runner when he wants to clear his head. She seems hurt because she's like, wow, are you really just gonna act like it didn't happen? Are you the, it just didn't happen, it's not that big of a deal type of guy. Um, and it's just awkward and tense, but she drives him to the base. But before he leaves, he allows her to know that she is his next of kin. So if something happens, she can call his brother, but don't tell his father anything in regards to him being in the military. Being that now she has insurance and enough insulin to keep her alive, she can now focus on the joys of life, her music. She also sends Luke letters to kind of fill in the gaps because they quote, fell in love so quickly, obviously. This is a farce to make them look like a real marriage, but also to uh, learn more about each other. From this, again, we learn about Cassie's mother and her uh, string of boyfriends that all came from the base and that made her not trust military guys. From what I hear, I've never dated a dude in the military, but from what I hear, that is inherently a red flag. That might not be a bad idea to have that as a rule. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying don't do it, but what I'm saying is a lot of people say don't. 
Anyway, he responds in kind with information about his upbringing. Apparently he's a third generation Marine. His father got a purple heart after being injured in Desert Storm. But after high school, he joined the military because at the time he was going down a quote unquote bad path. He does not let her know about his past with addiction, but he's kind of vaguely like, yeah, there's a lot going on, which means he also doesn't tell her that he needs the extra money to pay off his former dealer. He also shares that he lost his mom to cancer and some various other things about his family dynamic. They FaceTime, and this is what I noticed, this is incredibly petty by the way, of all the things that are an issue with this movie, this is the last thing that should matter, but this is where I noticed she has a propensity to keeping her hair in the neck line of her sweaters and shirt so that it's this weird like, bowl thing going on and I hate it because I can viscerally feel hair on my neck every time she does it and she does it so many times that I could not ignore. Just get the bob, babe, just commit. They're FaceTiming, they awkwardly call each other babe. She mentions that she's currently working on a new song and all of the boys in the room are like, sing it for us and she's like, it's not ready yet. But fast forward and they FaceTime again and everyone's kind of in a weird headspace. Apparently there was an explosion and they nearly lost someone. Frankie is like, can we get that song you were supposed to be making because we could really use the cheer up right now. So she sings. Apparently it's a song that's been inspired by her husband, quote unquote, being off. And it's the song that's like, come back home. Her voice is grating, man. And they play it over and over and over over again. The reason they play it so much is because this ends up being her first hit single with her band. She starts getting some traction. People are around wanting to listen to them sing that one song that they made <laughs> at various different places until one day she gets a call from the military and they're like, hey, Luke has been injured in an explosion and has been airlifted and he's going to be in San Diego. He has a injury on one of his legs or both of his legs, a leg, right? Which is a big deal because he's like, I run. Cassie starts to panic and eventually contacts Luke's brother only to accidentally go to Luke's father's house because Luke's brother is a junior. They have the same name. She ends up telling the father that Luke was uh, injured in combat. Apparently he didn't even know that he enlisted. And she also admits that she is Luke's wife. Once Luke is out of surgery, his entire family comes to visit him. Luckily, he seems to be in a place that just several months of maybe some rehab, he should be able to make a full recovery. But now we're in a pickle because like Luke is back home and that wasn't the plan. He was supposed to be away and she was just supposed to get his insurance and we'd never have to cohabitate like a real marriage. But now we've been put in a situation where you're gonna have to move in with her and y'all are gonna have to live like a couple while his very, very um, by the book ex-military police officer dad is kind of staking them out. Speaking of which, the dad offers to take Luke to his physical therapy appointments every time he has to go, which apparently is several times a week. Um, that's also concerning that he's around them so much to see whether or not they're a real marriage. Oh, also we find out that Frankie dead. I told you, bitch, you shouldn't have latched on. At his funeral, Cassie gives Frankie's girlfriend who would have been fiance, the ring that he was supposed to give her. And she's like, oh, Frankie had me hold this for safekeeping until he came back so that he could propose to you. Okay. So now Luke is in the house and they are not happy about it, both of them. They argue about various things. One thing they argue about is because later she gets him like a helper dog um, and he takes that as her calling him weak, but he takes the dog anyway. And I'm sitting there like, exactly. Shut the f up, it's a free doggy. Slowly but surely, Luke is able to get some of his mobility back. One day she comes in and he's kind of able to walk a little bit, um, but he seems to be getting better. Somehow through the course of him getting better, suddenly they're kind of warming up to each other. He fixed her doorknob, ate a pickle jalapeno and nearly died. She gave him a sponge bath. Ugh. Suddenly she's allowing him to sleep in the bed with her. And I'm like, when, what happened? Nothing happened. Fundamentally, what has changed? Nothing. Just one day she's like, here's a dog. Let's laugh. 
ah ha ha, sleep next to me. And I'm like, what? They show up to family gatherings, particularly over Luke's dad's house to show how much of a couple they really are. Teases another song. So that's what we're here for. At least it's not the same one they've been playing. Let in my fears go, let in my eyes go. Like girl, shut the f up. Damn. But one day Cassie's mom's house gets vandalized. Someone throws a brick or something through her window. And apparently Luke is able to deduce that it was Jono. From what I understand, Jono is upset because Luke has stopped paying him. Why did you stop paying? Like, why did you stop paying him? Because he was paying him, by the way, sending him payments while he was in Iraq. So just one day he just stopped paying him. It's been long enough that you've been out of surgery for several months and you just didn't you just didn't pay him. They never say that he's like making less money because he's not on the battlefield or, or something like that. So like, why aren't you, why aren't you paying him? But once they get back, Cassie realizes that she hasn't been looking after like eating well and taking care of herself. And she starts to feel faint because you can't do that, especially when you have diabetes. So he gets her a glucose pouch and this is supposed to be romantic for some reason, I guess. This is officially the full on love story. He's scared of losing her, of her family getting hurt because of his decisions. So he goes out and beats Jono's ass with his cane. In the process, he gets kicked in his injured leg, wrestles with him to get his gun and gives all of the money that he owes Jono, which apparently he had. And up until this point, you had been sending it via wire transfer. So why you didn't just send all of it to him via wire transfer, but no, you go in already injured and impaired and said, let me beat him with my cane. Also, again, for a person that's threatening to kill your family members and people that are important to you, I don't think it was the best idea to especially unnecessarily go and antagonize him. So guess what he does? Jono goes to the mom and tells her about their fake marriage. He also goes to the military and says, everything he knows about their fake marriage. Cause this, by the way, he knew about it, by the way. I don't know if I ever said that because, because Luke told him about it for some reason. So now Luke has to finally admit to his past specifically to Cassie, because of course Cassie's mom is gonna tell Cassie. He is an addict. He's been sober for two years and Jono is his former dealer. Ended up in debt to Jono because he stole his dad's $50,000 Corvette in order to get drugs. The car was something that his dad was remodeling or making souping up or something for a client, but he stole it. And in the process of driving to get more drugs, he crashed and totaled it. His dad, again, military police was like, if you don't find the $50,000 to get me a new Corvette so I can send this to my client, I will turn you in myself. So he was able to make up some of the money, but he was still short $15,000, hence why he owes Jono that money. Cassie, who has flashing moments of being reasonable, she's like, get out of my house, stay with your dad or stay with your brother because you can't stay here, we're getting a divorce. Around this time, Luke suddenly realized that he can run again, so good for him. And Cassie is off doing shows. Her band is getting more and more popular as the days go on. They've gotten so big that she is now in talks of opening for Florence and the Machine. Soon after making this recovery though, Luke is um, approached by the military and they are charged with fraudulent marriage stuff. I don't know the technical terminology or whatever. So they have a court martial trial and Luke decides to make a statement at said trial suggesting, or no, outright saying that uh, Cassie had nothing to do with the fraudulent part of this marriage. He lies and says that he coerced her to get married and that he lied to her saying that it didn't violate anything. Um, so she shouldn't be held responsible. So he's sentenced to six months in jail and she isn't sentenced to anything. And so she's able to open for Florence and the Machine. But I guess spliced throughout this song, she realizes that she is actually truly in love with him. So she races out to see him as he's going off to prison. And she says, I love you. And he's like, I love you too. And I'm like, nobody thought to say, damn, I wish we reached this conclusion uh, prior to this. <laughs> like, cause I'm going to jail. 
And we actually love each other. That's crazy. Whatever. That's the movie. Shit is stupid. I just <laughs> this eyeliner makes me wish that I didn't have eyelids because it's really obstructing the beat. But anyway, yeah, that's it. This movie sucks. <laughs> And it's frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating to watch. If you like the movie, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> I want this movie wiped from my memory. I want to act like this never happened. It never existed. And y'all never let it happen. Y'all didn't say it was a good idea. I'm pissed. And it's too late at night to be pissed. It is 2 a.m. <laughs> anyway, so if you like this video, <laughs> and like hearing me rant, then uh, you should like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. If you have more bad movies that you think I should check out, feel free to put those down in the comments section. That wasn't a full sentence. Be sure to put those down in the comment section. There you go. And I will see you guys next time.